How much do we know about the evidence of Jesus? That's what we're going to find out today. I would say that much of religious heresy is a result of misunderstanding of the basic nature of God. Once we have a proper understanding of God, then usually most of the areas of our life coincide with who God is and what he desires for each one of us. Josh McDowell. Today we're going to talk about Josh McDowell in general, and I wanted you to know a bit about him if you've never heard of him. He was an atheist and he went to prove that Jesus wasn't true. He didn't buy any of this. And the end result of his investigation as a detailed lawyer about Jesus ended up with him becoming a Christian because, as his book says, evidence that demands a verdict, historical evidence for the Christian faith. He says his searching started when he was a teenager. He wanted to be happy. And this comes from his own biography on crew.org. He went to all the churches, he said, when the doors open, morning, noon, and night. And he must have picked the wrong church because every time he went, he would feel worse. His upbringing was a farm in Michigan. Here fits my Michigan, way up north. But he understood that religion was a big part of everyone's life. And he said that part of his role, practicality, is if something's not working, get rid of it. And so he did. He said he got rid of the church. He thought that he could find happiness and prestige. Again, he became this very big lawyer. He started noticing other kinds of people, you know, gathered in groups of eight people, and they would be different backgrounds and different kinds of people. And he could tell that they had a different kind of happiness about them. They had the happiness that he was seeking. And it appeared to be coming from the inner self instead of something that was making them. And so he was talking, he said, in his student union, and he was pretty skeptical about the topics of God because, remember, he left the church. So that was something in his rear view mirror. He talked to another student and he said, quote, tell me, why are you so different from all the other students and faculty on campus? What changed your life? And he said that that person turned to him and said, Jesus Christ. He snaps back, quote, Jesus Christ, I'm fed up with religion. I'm fed up with the church and I'm fed up with the Bible. And she shot back and she said, I didn't say religion. I said, Jesus Christ. And then he knew something different, that Christianity isn't a religion. It isn't a group of humans trying to make rules for themselves. But instead, Jesus Christ claims to be the son of God in flesh, on earth, died for our sins. And that's when he started his challenge, that he was going to Prove them wrong. And that's what I loved about this. I was big into Josh McDowell when I first became a Christian because when you become a Christian, you think, did I make the right choice? Did I make the right decision? Am I coming about this the right way? Or am I just making my life feel better because now I think something else is out there? You know, I never felt bad thinking that nothing was out there. I never felt sad that I would die and not go to heaven which some people think that's what makes people become a Christian. I was perfectly fine. In fact, I was the happiest I'd ever been in my life because I was living on my own. I didn't have any of the things that were going on in my house. And you know what? My life was going now pretty darn well. I had control over my own life for the first time. I didn't need religion and I certainly didn't need Jesus. And so I was not interested in it. And again, I was sort of the nice atheist who you know, if you that's what you need, that's fine, but don't talk to me about it. And if you did, I would make you sorry that you did. I would ask you questions you couldn't answer. So that's where he started doing the research because he was going to prove his friend wrong. And the more research he did, again, he was pre-law, he understood evidence because that's what he was learning to do was to drive up evidence when it comes to a court case. He said, quote, I was sure that if I could uncover indisputable evidence that the Bible is not unreliable record, the whole Christianity would crumble. (laughs) You know, I think a lot of atheists feel that way because when you talk to someone and you tell me you're a Christian, they say, oh yeah, but did you think about how Noah got the animals on the ark? Or, oh yeah, did you think that it was probably just all made up and that Jesus was buried in the tomb and no one ever took his body? Did you ever think of that? So they suspect that you might go, oh, you know what? You're right. I never did think of that. 
okay, I'm going to walk away from my faith now. Of course, throughout the entire time of Jesus existing on this planet until now, people have thought about those things over and over again. And they all think that I'm going to be able to say this one sentence that will bring people to their senses. <laughs> so it's kind of funny because they're always like the same sentences. Do you know that the Bible is not congruent with itself all the time? Yeah, there's 40 passages that are not congruent with the Bible that they found. 40 passages out of how many, you know, again, the Bible in Small Steps is 1,189 episodes of the podcast, and there are 40 sentences, and they're minor between tiny words here and there that are discrepant. You're right. That's not a lot of discrepancy. <laughs> so you think that you can say these things, and people who don't understand how minuscule these issues are, they think they can talk you out of your faith. But when he started realizing that he had to admit Jesus was, he said, quote, more than a carpenter. He was all that he claimed to be. But he said it didn't turn his brain around. He still had questions. And so he still went in looking for evidence. He said there was two reasons he had for his reluctance in general. Part of it was pleasure which means that he didn't want to give up on control. He wanted to live the way he wanted to live. And this was possibly going to ruin his good time. And then the other was pride. You know, I think when you become a Christian and you realize that the way you were living or the things that you were thinking were wrong, it is a bit humiliating in a sense, because how many people did I tell, I don't want to be a Christian, I'm not going to become a Christian. And then suddenly you're a Christian. You know, there's a lot of people who knew me when I was younger and were surprised I became a Christian. And I think even maybe to some extent a bit disappointed. Where's that person who used to tell all the dirty jokes? Where's that person who used to be so funny I would howl? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not as funny as I used to be, but, you know, I did become a Christian and it changed me and it changed who I was. And so he also felt that same way. And I understood when he talked about that. So he prayed to establish a relationship with Christ. He wanted to confess that these things that God wants him to do, he doesn't want to do. He doesn't like it. It doesn't sound enticing to him. And that he knows that the best way is to tell Jesus to take control of his life because he doesn't want to. So he's going to ask Jesus to do it anyway. And finding his faith was a process, he said, that turned him from this, quote, hard-nosed research person into having an experience that changed his life. So that's why I wanted to share with you a little bit about Josh McDowell, just because he came from that place of skepticism. This is not true. I can categorically prove this is not true. Let me show you how. So what he did is he wrote a couple of books. One of them, which is his big two-volume tome of evidence called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And it's volume one and volume two. And he just has a lot of other books. One of those that I read is called More Than a Carpenter, which is a fantastic book. He says, his story might change yours. And then the other one that's nice, it's a little bit more condensed than the evidence that demands a verdict. This one's called A Ready Defense. Again, this guy's a lawyer, and so he is good at evidence. But it's there to give you... The idea of what's true and not true. What evidence can you find that exists that the Bible, things happened as they said they did? He also has a handbook of difficult verses. You know, sometimes things are hard to interpret and understand. I know I am doing the Bible in small steps and sometimes I hit something and I go, wait, what? And so those types of resources are valuable. So I recommend Josh McDowell in general. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the evidence that he pulled together. Again, his books are huge, so there's no real way to even do a book review about them. But he says, in general, that we should be prepared, apologia, which is the Greek word, apologetics, to give a defense. Because we're going to get hit with a lot of people telling us, well, this didn't happen or that didn't happen. My dad said that, one, Jesus was made up by the Romans so that, he, that the people wouldn't rebel. Well, it didn't go very well because the Christian world ate the Roman Empire. So that didn't go very well. The other part of it was, is that this book was a bunch of apostles of probably some dude who are just trying to make themselves look great. Like, look at us. We were the apostles of the Lord. 
you never read the Bible because it's very clear that these people do not look good. So he does not know what he's talking about. So he says that it's up to us to have that defense. I did not become a Christian because someone defended all these points and came to me like a lawyer. But I do think being able to hit these points on the head. So then when my dad would say things like, well, you do know that the apostles were just trying to make themselves look good. I'd be like, nope, that's not true. And here's why. It's not going to make my dad a Christian or it's not going to turn someone's mind. But addressing them, first of all, will make you feel stronger. But secondly, it will show other people who might be overhearing this conversation that that other person is drastically wrong about what they're saying. And the third point is that that might make that person question at least the very things that they believe about the Bible. The one big thing that made me question my beliefs about the Bible was actually spending two summers in Israel. Because to me, and according to my dad, this was just a bunch of made-up baloney that none of it's true. And then I was on an archaeological dig, and you can look it up. I found a pet cemetery in Ashkelon. You can Google it, and you'll see what it is. It doesn't have my name on it, unfortunately, because it's part of a university. But we got on these tours of these archaeological digs. Oh, here's Jericho. As you can see, the walls are not blown out. Oh, well, what about that city right over there, just like 20 feet away, where the walls are blown out? So the very city that has its walls blown out is completely wrong for no reason other than you think this one's the right one. Or that there's a tunnel in Hezekiah's rain so they could get water into the city of Jerusalem while the Assyrians were, I believe it was Assyrians, were outside holding siege against them. There's a tunnel. You can walk through it and it's free. They just charge you for the light. So there were things that I suddenly started seeing when I was in Israel and going, oh, this stuff is actually really here. I was told this was baloney and here it is. So it was stunning to me. So I didn't have a person giving me evidence. I had an entire country giving me evidence. If you look at his book, and like I said, I highly recommend his books, he goes through in details all the points. Point by point, he'll talk about the reason why most people rejected Christ. He said in most cases it was ignorance. He said often self-imposed ignorance. And he quotes Romans 1, 18 through 23 or Matthew 22 through 29. Pride, I know better. I'm the guy who studied it. I know all the stuff. Or moral problems. I'm living this other kind of life and I don't want to change. No one said, you're wrong. There was no Messiah. Because if you talk to my grandmother and you talk to people that I talked to about Judaism, oh, we never expected there to be a Messiah. Israel's the Messiah. Or Messiah is a freedom in our heart. It's not like a real person. Or it was Elijah. Elijah was coming back. He's the Messiah. And when I bought a bunch of books when I was in the old city of Jerusalem, because I really then was curious, wait a minute. So Jews didn't believe in the Messiah? I tried to figure out what it was they did believe. And sure enough, they did believe in a Messiah. And I talked to some people when I was in the old city about it because my understanding of what was expected was completely wrong. The other part of it, too, is you will find people who live inside of Israel who do not believe Israel is a country. They won't vote. They won't participate. And the reason for that is because Israel cannot exist again in the country until the Messiah has come. But it does exist. And so they refuse to recognize it because the Messiah clearly has not come according to them. And so for those of us who are Christian, we go, oh, well, there it is. Just by you ignoring it doesn't make it go away. It does exist. It is a country. And therefore, it is evidence, according to your own faith, that Jesus was the Messiah. So he just talks about like how the Bible was written over a 1,500-year span through 40 different generations, and people were just regular people. Moses was trained in the Egyptian universities. Peter was a fisherman. Amos was a herdsman. Joshua was a general. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Daniel was a prime minister. Luke's a doctor. Solomon's a king. But all sorts of people, rich and poor, they were called from all sorts of locations, wildernesses, dungeons, hillsides, prisons, you know, all the places that they went to were a smattering of people. This was not like a group of cultists or conspirators 
trying to piece together this one narrative. These were people who lived hundreds of years apart, never saw each other. There was oral tradition, which means that, you know, mothers and fathers would tell their children, memorize scripture. The rabbis who could read Hebrew would read it to people. Most people couldn't read. But this was brought down generation after generation after generation. Then you also have to realize that at 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. So you would think that Jesus comes in and says, you know, this temple is coming down. If they were writing it in a later period of time, they would then say, and therefore what Jesus said was true. In 70 AD, the temple came down. No mention of it. There's no talking about it. There's no saying that it happened the way that Jesus said it happened because the oral tradition, the written tradition was happening before 70 AD. I'm listening to a lecture series that's been kind of interesting talking about the Bible and the history. And and he said that a lot of the passages we find, because there were people, Clementine, Justin Martyr, who were alive or their parents were alive at the time the apostles were alive. So there are direct connections of these people taking over churches from people who knew Jesus, knew apostles. And the reason there was such a panic for things to start getting written down around 125 AD is because the apostles died and the people who knew the apostles were dying. And so we had to write it down in order to keep this going. And I think that was a very interesting comment. We had those people walking around. And so if you wanted to know what Peter's experience was walking with Jesus, you could probably go talk to him for a long time. John, who was exiled to Patmos, probably died around 90 AD. So he was around and available. I mean, he was exiled, but he was there. But once the apostles started dying and the people who walked with the apostles Now we have a problem, and so those things have to start coming into writing. And he talks a little bit about some extra biblical information. Some of those documents were written throughout time. Some of them were down on paper later and became that. And for the most part, people like me would say, well, you see, the Bible came so much later, probably made up by people in the third century. And that was the big statement. Everyone said that. We don't think the Assyrians even existed. We don't think forgot who it was, Cyrus II or Sargon, maybe it was Sargon, ever lived. Those people weren't real. These nations weren't real. None of this was real. And then something happened. Archaeology started finding those things. Archaeology found these nations. Archaeology found the Hebrew alphabet that predates the Phoenician language. Archaeology found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which brings the writing of passages all the way back, I think some 900 years older than what we previously had. And guess what? When you match Isaiah to the Isaiahs found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the changes were minuscule and not one of them changed the meaning of the language. So you have that history. And so this is a lot what Josh McDowell talks about. Like I said, there's no way to review all those things, but we're going to go ahead and end right here. And then next week, I'm going to talk about some of the interesting things I found in rereading Josh McDowell's books. And I'm going to do a personal deeper dive into this. And I recommend that for you too. These books are astonishing. And I think that they were written some time ago, although they've been updated. But every year we find more and more things. A tomb of James or the tomb of Caiaphas or this inscription that says Pontius Pilate was the governor. I remember reading Pontius Pilate didn't even exist. He wasn't a governor. He doesn't have anything. And then all of a sudden you find this cut stone, says something to the extent of Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of this area. Oops. So archaeology every year is proving the Bible to be more and more true. I know what I went through the tunnel of Hezekiah, which was my favorite thing to do when I was in the old city of Jerusalem. The Bible said that there was a plaque that was created because they dug on either ends and met each other. And no one knows engineering-wise, how they could get two ends of a tunnel to meet without modern measuring things. They were 12 feet apart or something like that vertically, but it was amazing to not have the types of things we have that could do that. I thought, oh, they're just telling us that that plaque exists and then, you know, whatever. 
And then I just looked it up last week. Sure enough, the plaque is in Turkey. You can see it. I'm like, oh, that plaque was actually really there. So my challenge to you is see if you can take a look at some of the evidence that Josh McDowell portrays. Some of it's online, so you don't even have to buy the book. But look at the evidence for the scriptures being written at those times and for some of the people who knew apostles, who took over churches from the apostles. Really quite stunning. And remember that you can email me all the time at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. And again, the new podcast, The Bible in Small Steps, we're doing a slow roll through the Bible. We're going through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and other teaching. It is dense with information, but it's exactly why I thought that kind of podcast would be great because we could do that in small steps and really understand them for real. And remember, our walk through history and evidence of Jesus starts with small steps. <music>